All right, let's do some of the Anoki questions here, and then we'll get to Ra here at the end. This person says, Dave, my Pakistani grandfather was a big Anoki fan and was convinced that pro wrestling was real after Anoki faced a Pakistani star called Akram. I have read that Anoki's Akram fight... Akram Pal- 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 Inoki, you know, one of the things about Inoki... Well, let me finish the story. I've read that Inoki's fight against him started as a work, ended as a shoot with Inoki breaking his arm. Is that a true story? Yeah, basically. Um, I have to rewatch that match. But, I mean, the match... I believe the story was... So, so, so this would have been... Inoki in Pakistan, it's like one of those things that people don't know about. But, but there was a... You know, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, like, gave a big speech... Um, about uh you know Inoki's death. Inoki was very very famous in Pakistan because of the two matches he had there and then in like I think it was 80 I'm going to say 83 84 um they did a stadium tour in Pakistan with a bunch of different stadiums and they did between 30 and 45,000 people every night. Um Inoki was there he wrestled. What was interesting is one of the guys that he wrestled on that tour, I think, um, I don't remember the entire tour. I would have to look it up, but it was it was a big, big success. Um, but one of the guys was was um, the Masked Superstar, or Demolition Axe, whatever name you want to use. But he was, he was a big star in New Japan as the Masked Superstar, and Inoki brought him over to be his opponent, one of his key opponents on that tour. And he didn't wear the mask, so you... And, and it was on television in Japan, so I... You know, you would see Mass Superstar as Billy Crusher wrestling without the mask, you know, when he was so protective of concealing his face, but, uh, you know, you know, and and everything. But anyway, so so th- this was like in 83 when he went there, but he did the Akram match was in 76. And I believe it was supposed to be a work, but it did turn into a shoot. Um I guess the story is that Akram bit Inoki and wasn't cooperating. Um, and Akram, you know, was, you know, like this this shooter champion. And Inoki did armbar him and break his arm. That's true. And then the match that a lot of people forgot. I mean, and it's well known in Pakistan. You know, it was at a big stadium there. With uh, I think the Akram match had 50,000 people. And the, the rematch, which was Akram's nephew... And Inoki, which had 30,000 people, um, which I saw the match. Um, God, like it, it's like it's like it was a match that was like not really known in Japan or, or really publicized when he went back there. The Akram match was on I've, I've, I had seen before in Japanese television. And that match, you know, I mean, you know, in, in, in you know, he definitely gets the armbar and breaks his arm. Um, but the 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 match with the, the nephew um, who's a, a powerful 19 year old who had trained for years to avenge the loss. And they brought in Oki in 79 and they went 25 minutes in, an, in what certainly looked, uh, at, at, to, to, to be a shoot at some point. Um, I mean, you could see like the guy taking an Oki down and Oki, um, you know, trying to get submissions from the bottom and, and using guard and things like that, which never were, were done in pro wrestling. And, I mean, it looks more, you know, like something from, you know, like 40 years ahead of its time or 30 years ahead of its time. And um, the guy was too strong for Inoki. And Inoki got, you know, um, and uh, it, but they went the 25 minutes. It was ruled a draw. But in India, you know, Inoki raised his hand and they and they build it as Inoki um, signifying that he had lost. So it was sort of considered Inoki losing in a shoot in Pakistan. But he got he waved to the crowd and they thought he was praying to I don't know if it's Allah or whoever their their God is. And he became so popular for a Japanese guy to be praying to their God. And Inoki himself didn't even know that's what he was doing. Um, he just, I think Inoki's thing of of saying that, you know, the other guy won, like kind of conceding the win to him after the time limit expired was because he thought he wasn't going to get out alive because when he broke Akram's arm, there was like a, a riot and it was very, very dangerous. So, um, you know, he didn't want that riot again, and he was very, very scared. I remember him telling Irv Mushnick, 
years later when he did an interview with Irv Mushnick and um, he talked about like um, the, the, the um, you know, he talked about the Ali match and said that the Ali match was, you know, very scary for him and he was very proud of the match because, you know, he was put in under, you know, rules that were not exactly favorable to him and he survived. And then he also talked about how scared he was because he was afraid that, uh, you know, somebody might shoot him in Pakistan um, on that second match and that somehow he did something and they perceived it as, you know, praying to their God and they all loved him and he didn't even really know what he was doing at the time. He was just trying to sort of concede defeat to get out of there alive, so to speak, or get out of there without without a riot. Sports here says, what was the deal with Antonio Noki's matches with Roland Bach? Legend has it that Japanese audiences were shocked by how Bach handled Inoki in their match in Europe. Have you ever seen that match? You no. know about that? That's a very famous match. So this was, um, uh, I'm going to say 79, 80, 81. So Roland Bach was a guy who was in the 68 Olympics as a Greco-Roman heavyweight. And Inoki wrestled him in Europe. And... I saw the match, and it was very famous. It was like a shitty match, and Roland Bach wouldn't sell anything for Anoki, and Anoki's trying to to do something with him, and Roland Bach's basically ragdolling him. You know, he's just too strong and too powerful for him. And they disqualified Roland Bach. They found a reason to DQ him. And I just remember the end. It's like Carl Gotch was in Anoki's corner, and he's wearing this loud plaid suit, I think, but this crazy-looking suit. And he got in there, and, and even Carl was like, you know, didn't know what to make of Roland Bach, you know, I mean, just being so uncooperative. Um, so, yeah, Roland Bach was uncooperative, but the match did air in Japan, and because of that, um, you know, Roland Bach did get a, get a tour, or maybe two, um, with New Japan, where he basically came in and didn't sell, like, was so unprofessional, didn't sell anything for anyone, but... Like the legend of Roland Bach in Japan as this super shooter, because, you know, he basically ragdolled Anoki and then he came to Japan and, you know, everyone that he was in, he just destroyed, you know, like he was this monster, more of a monster than any of the Americans or anybody like that. Um, you know, you would like, I remember when I went to Japan in 84 and everybody thought like Roland Bach was the supreme shooter of all shooters because Anoki couldn't do nothing with him and, um, and he came in and, you know, nobody could do anything with him. But, um, you know, he was just, he was basically a really strong, um, totally not charismatic, older guy who didn't look like much, but, you know, could obviously, you know, Olympic level wrestler and a big dude and a big strong guy. And, um, you know, the, he, he, kind of had this legend about him like when they would have like uh i remember they would have books of like like um the greatest fighters of all time in round robin comic books and they would have ali and they would have you know george foreman and they would have um you know um karate guys that were big stars and kickboxers that were big you know big champions and roland bach would be in those tournaments as one of like these super shooters with Anoki, of course was always in because of his rep in japan so uh yeah roland bach was a, a very um interesting one for sure you know um the other one there's another Anoki shoot story which you know you could probably look this one up and uh, the, all these matches are the the um the the Inoki matches in Pakistan are on the internet. You could find them because I've seen them both. And then the I think that you could probably find the Roland Bach match, but I'm not sure. But I know that you could probably find some Roland Bach stuff because I remember when Roland Roland Bach, um, I think he passed away, and I was looking his stuff up. So the other one was the Great Antonio, which was in Sumo Hall, and. Like, he came in, and I don't know what his deal was. Because, I mean, he'd wrestled for, you know, he was like a, a, a star wrestler in the 60s. And then he went to um, Japan, and he, he pulled a bus. Um, and he became a big, big attraction. and um, But was just completely unruly and everything like that. And um, I think Carl Gotch had to fuck him up at one point. 
And then Ricky Dozan at the end fucked him up again because he was just so uncooperative. So because of the legend of the great Antonio, um, when he was older, you know, this is like um, 77. So it's probably about, you know, um, I don't know, 14 years later or so. He wrestled Inoki in a big main event, and it was a big, big deal. And the great Antonio um, just wouldn't sell at all. And he started, like, trying to shoot on Inoki. And Inoki just, you know, he just beat the shit out of him. You almost have to watch it. It's like, uh, that's like a, you know, that turned into, like, a real fight. And um, and Inoki just, just beat the shit out of him. This person says, did Inoki live in New York City? What dates? Did he ever defend the NWF title in the Cleveland Buffalo Territory? And were there hard feelings between him and Sakaguchi? I don't know if there were hard feelings with him and Sakaguchi. You know, they were a famous tag team in the 70s. Um, Inoki did live in New York for a while. Um, I don't remember the years, but um, it was... Um, it was during the Inoki Gnome Federation years. But um, he was live. He would live in New York, and then he would fly back to Japan for the shows. So yeah, yeah. And yes, there are uh, Roland Bach and Noki matches on YouTube. If you want to, uh, YouTube and Daily Motion has got. Uh, yeah, I think that there versions. might have been um, one or two of their matches, but the one in Europe is the one that's the the famous one. Um, I they may have done a rematch in Japan. I just remember Roland Bach just, you know, like, uh, I mean, he was not, he was a terrible pro wrestler, but he got over really big by not selling, essentially, and just by being a powerhouse, and everyone believed, I mean, the people believed in him, you know, that he was like, they thought of him like, um, he wasn't as famous as Carl Gotch or, or um, you know, um, you know, one of the, I guess, yeah, Carl Gotch would be the most famous shooter, I guess, of the guys that were you know, known there, but, um, um, but, you know, he was like considered at that level, like a Carl Gotch, just because of, um, what he did in the pro wrestling ring by being uncooperative, just by being unprofessional. A lot of questions with, uh, Baba and Inoki comparisons who had the biggest impact on pro wrestling. I mean, the biggest impact overall would be Inoki. Without a doubt. I mean, he formed New Japan. Um, I know Baba formed All Japan. But, um, you know, Baba... I mean, Baba was... Uh, Inoki, you know, did... Uh, I mean, Baba was the bigger star in the 60s. But Inoki became the bigger star in the 70s and 80s. Um, and, um, you know, Inoki... You know, New Japan did a lot of different concepts. All Japan was basically, you know, American pro wrestling, Japanese pro wrestling mix. Um, you know, they had, the, I mean, in the 90s, obviously, All Japan had a, you know, and in the 80s, I mean, All Japan did, had, had um, you know, very major league wrestling and everything like this, but still New Japan was, was bigger most of the time. Mid-80s, All Japan was bigger. And then in Tokyo, um, All Japan was bigger in the 90s during that Misawa and Kawada and, you know, that era. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I mean, with Inoki, you know, he did more worldwide, you know, they did the Ali fight, uh, he did, um, you know, um, he, he tried to export new, new, new Japan into different parts of the world and he himself wrestled all over the world and, um, you know, the martial arts stuff. Um, so, I mean, Inoki, Inoki to me, you know, and, and I, I can't even come up. I mean, Baba is probably the third most influential person in wrestling in the last 50 years. Vince McMahon being first, Inoki being second. I would probably say, ba um, you know, and then after that, I mean, you know, you could argue. I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, Sam Mushnick, Vern Gagne, Hogan, um, you know, but, um, you know the, but Anoki's to you know Anoki's very clear number two, I think. All right, we got one more here that kind of has to do with Anoki. Uh, Why wasn't Seiji Sakaguchi a bigger star? He had the size and judo background, but he never felt on the level of guys like Fujinami, Choshu, Jumbo, and Tenru. Did Anoki basically hog all the attention in the seventies when Sakaguchi was at his peak, leading to Sakaguchi not reaching a bigger level of stardom? Sakaguchi was a big star, but he was not. I mean, in the 70s, it was Baba and Inoki as the two big stars. 
and Sakaguchi. Um, I mean, Jumbo Saruta was a bigger star than Sakaguchi, but Sakaguchi uh, was the number two star in New Japan until Fujinami outshined him um, later because he was younger. But yeah, I mean, Sakaguchi was was big and he was a, a you know a judo champion, but um, he didn't have Inoki's charisma. And he was never pushed as, like, Inoki was pushed as a world beater. I mean, it was like, you know, Inoki was, you know, it's not that Inoki held him back. He was number two, but but he shouldn't have been number one. He was, I mean, he did not have the charisma to be number one. Um, he didn't have the charisma to be number one in if he had stayed with uh, with Baba. Um, and Saruta would have passed him. You know, it's just, a, so, I mean, I think Sakaguchi had the career that he should have had um strong number two you know he 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 got to beat most of the top guys tag team champion i mean he was not as big as fujinami and choshu in the 80s but by that point he was past his prime and choshu you know was uh was also more charismatic you know more charismatic than sakaguchi but um in his prime you know i mean it was like uh inoki and sakaguchi were the big tag team and he was you know, he he wrestled the same top guys that Inoki wrestled, and he beat most of them, but uh, didn't draw like Inoki. And um, I think that they gave him a uh, World League one year. You know, um, I, I don't know how they DQ'd Inoki out of it or something, but I seem to remember, um, you know, Inoki would win almost every year, but I think Sakaguchi got to win it once. And Sakaguchi and Inoki were originally the, uh, the, the big tag team champions, and then... Um, it was uh, Sakaguchi and Riki Choshu before Riki Choshu did the turn, you know, and and became kind of a cool heel and everything. But um, yeah, I I mean, it 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 uh, and you know I can't say Inoki held him back because I think you know he was he was in the position that he should have been in. Hey, if you're a big fan of Wrestling Observer Radio, we got twelve thousand episodes of all of our podcasts up at our website wrestlingobserver.com. If you sign up today, you get access to every single one of them. The 12 to 18 new shows that we do every single week. You can podcast them, listen to them on the road, at work, working out, in the shower, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And also full access to the Wrestling Observer newsletter and archives. So if you love what you hear, head to WrestlingObserver.com. 12,000 audio shows at your fingertips.